bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Please notice that in your King James or New King James versions of the Bible, must do, the last two words are italicized. They were inappropriately added by the translators. This verse is not meant to be a command from the mountaintop. It's not a must do. It's an automatic. As Christ forgave you, you'll automatically forgive each other. It's not, do I forgive them? Should I forgive them? Forgiveness starts to flow naturally out of the man and woman that knows they are forgiven. How many of you found this to be true? I am so forgiven, how can I not forgive? It's not really an option. I just naturally forgive because I know I'm forgiven, and if, no one, if anyone on this earth didn't deserve it, it was me. And so now that I have received it, how can I not give it back? 14. We're getting there. We're not there yet. We're just on our fun little journey to get there. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And so love tops and caps it all. We could say a lot about that, but let's move on. 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And I don't want to overstate the case. I don't want to oversell it, but I'm going to say it. What you just saw on the screen could be the single most important verse you'll ever read in your life after you have the knowledge that Jesus finished the work. Why? Because we live by the heart in the realm of the Spirit. We live by the heart. We don't live by the law. We don't live by the outward. We live by the inward. The law of God's been written on our hearts. From our heart comes our obedience, comes our, the outflow of our love. And we need to know how to control that thing. The heart. We need to know how to live in a way in which we are flowing the way the heart's supposed to flow. And so we got the phrase, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let's look at that word rule. Greek word brabeo. The Greek word brabeo means to serve as an umpire. Now, my title is Peace as an Umpire. And when I think of umpire, I think of baseball, softball, because that's sort of the, the way that word is used in our vernacular in the Western Hemisphere, in the Western world, particularly in America. And that means calls balls and strikes, calls you out, calls you safe, kind of keeps the game within the chalk, keeps the, the framework of the game going as long as you're following the rules. That's what an umpire does. However, that's an anachronism for the Apostle Paul. There was no baseball. So Paul's not talking about baseball and softball umpires because he doesn't even know what baseball and softball is, which is a crying shame. <laughs> But it's not his fault. And so, but what he does have is what we would refer to now as the Olympic Games, although at the time it was basically what we were taught, what, what would be referred to as the sporting games or the games in, in Rome. And what those games consisted of is a lot of what ended up in our Summer Olympics. There was javelin throwing and, and there was jumping and there was running and there was hurdling and there was all the things that we categorize a lot of as track and field. And there was also wrestling. Which, and Paul uses all these metaphors in his writings. If you'll read the epistles, Paul says, we've fought a good fight. Paul says, uh, if any man runs the race, he must continue to run. He says, um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. And he uses all those sports metaphors in his preaching. Well, when he gets to Colossians chapter 3, he mentions brabeo. And brabeo means to serve as an umpire. And it's not baseball. It's that Olympic judge whose job was to figure out who wins. So the, what the umpire would do in the games is he would watch the wrestling match and then he would determine the winner. He would watch the race. He would stand at the race line and as the runners passed the line, he would declare who won the race. He was the umpire. His word ruled. So when the translators got to Brabeo out of the Greek and they went to the English, probably would have been a little more convenient if they would have said, let the peace of God rule as an umpire in your life. But instead they said, let the peace of God rule. And for most of us, we missed the implication of what's supposed to happen in us. And why I said this verse is so important is because notice that peace serves as your ump. Peace is the one that is either present or disturbed. If peace is there, then you know that your heart is in the right place. If peace is not there, then you know that something has gone wrong. Because, and, and why this is so important is what Paul says in Galatians 5.25. If you live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. Think about it this way. I'm not, Paul's not saying some of you live in the Spirit, some of you don't live in the Spirit. Paul's saying, 
If it's true that you live in the Spirit, so let's establish if it's true that you live in the Spirit. How many of you believe that when you accept Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit? Now, if you don't understand that, let me try to explain why I believe you do. Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. And when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and He shall lead and guide you into all truth. And there's a lot of stuff I'd like to tell you now, but I can't tell you. But when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to tell you that stuff. And now that was 2,000 years ago. So for 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit has been doing His job. Remember this verse? The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus. The law versus grace. But what's on the other side? The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth was given by Jesus. What's truth? Jesus said, when I leave, the Spirit of truth will come. Now we call Him the Holy Ghost. So what accompanies the grace of God that keeps us from hitting the rocks? The Holy Spirit. If I set you free on the ocean of grace, here's where a lot of our criticisms come in. You go down there in the middle and they don't take it sin seriously. And you've got to go down there and it's going to tell you to live any old way. And what the perception is, is that we have shoved your boat out onto the ocean of freedom and waved by. See you next week if you come back. And that's so erroneous because the reality is, is that you've been pushed out onto the ocean of freedom, but you have a rudder called the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit is in you. Now the difference is, we trust the Holy Spirit in you. I trust the Holy Spirit in you enough, and I trust you enough, that you can listen to the Holy Spirit without a weekly update from Pastor Paul. Without me giving you a call saying, have you been doing this and this and this and this? Are you signed up for enough stuff? Because we need to make sure you're committed enough that you come back. Because if you don't come back, we're not sure you're going to live right. If you don't live right, then you must be living wrong. And then, and then everything's going to be for naught. And then we're going to look bad. But the truth is, is that you receive Christ, you receive the rudder of the Holy Spirit. Because grace and truth are a package deal, man. You can't get around it. So when your boat gets shoved out into the ocean of freedom, the Holy Spirit's there so you don't hit the rocks.